Welcome back to RPTV News Weekly. My name is Kedar and my co-hosts are Fred, Matthew, Victoria and Jabin. We present news that impacts on Regent Park and the surrounding areas. In this episode, we present the following news for the week February 7 to February 14, 2023. CSI announces the end of CSI Community Living Room project at Daniel Spectrum. Community resident meeting discussion on rezoning. Moss Park residents mourn the loss of 61 tree cutdowns by Metrolinx. Protesters rally to increase access to shelter spaces. City of Toronto expands warming centre space. Two people stabbed in Sherburn Street and Dundas Street East area. City of Toronto proclaims February as Black History Month as city celebrates with an in-person events across Toronto. COVID-19 and vaccination update. Toronto Public Health expands access to required children's vaccine through its immunization clinics events and jobs in Regent Park. CSI announces the end of the CSI Community Living Room project at the Daniel Spectrum. Denise Sudan O'Leary, the Director of Projects and Partnerships with the Centre for Social Innovations, announced the end of a year-long community living room project located on the first floor of the Daniel Spectrum Art Centre. Initiated by CSI with support of Artscape, the community living room is a barrier-free lounge area that was comfortably furnished and allowed community members free access to relax, read, work, and play. Unfortunately, CSI has announced that they will no longer be managing that space. We launched the community living room in March of 2022, March 23rd of 2022. So it's been just about a year that we've been in this space um, and it has been an overwhelming success. Uh, we've heard things from the community like uh, this is their second home. Uh, we've heard communities say that um, this is a place where they feel safe and they feel comfortable. Um, this is a place where they've been able to um, realize their dreams as an entrepreneur and start to build the, the baseline of their business with the right support and the right training. Um, it's a place where we um, encourage people to uh, meet their neighbors. Um, and uh, somebody just said to me the other day, oh, I forgot to call you back because I was in the community living room and all my friends were there and I just got distracted. Um, and I was, of course, not mad because that's music to my ears that this space has become this gathering space for the community. Um, it's also an entrepreneurial space. We've uh, worked with the Employment and Economic Development Table um, and the Women's Entrepreneurship Group to help build uh, women-owned and, and, and uh, women-led uh, businesses in the, this community. Um, lots of the, the local caterers and lo local makers and Gale and Zero Bar, of course. Um, we started with the Moonlight Market on the patio, and now we're working on a cafe space. Um, and we've uh, added training, everything entrepreneur, and some other courses uh, to really help stimulate local residents in terms of moving things forward. And these are the pillars of, again, community wealth building, where you, where you stimulate local business and you stimulate local residents to, um, uh, to build uh, systems in their community that help them support themselves. Really what this comes down to is that there isn't a, a funding model, there isn't a business model that supports community work. Community work requires funding and it requires donation and it requires somebody to pay for it. There isn't a model that allows us to to sustainably do this work that, that doesn't have an exchange of finances. And that's unfortunately the reality. Um, and that's why we're committed to this idea of community wealth building. How do we build a sustainable future for communities where we build these kinds of assets that communities have access to? Um, and, and, but without that sustainable model, without the funding to continue to pay for the resources and to be really honest, to pay for my salary to do this kind of work, um, it makes it very hard to continue this kind of work. At the end of the day, this work requires funding um, and we unfortunately, the, the unfortunate reality of this kind of work is that we have to go where there is dollars for us to be able to do that. Um, and so this, again, this is not a goodbye, it's just a, a sort of reassessment of, of where CSI takes our community wealth work and what our opportunities come up either back in Regent Park or elsewhere for us to continue to build uh, community wealth infrastructure in, in communities like Regent Park and across the entire GTA.
we've proven that this model of the community living room works. You can see that there's people behind me and, and this space is a bustling space. Um, and because this model works, uh, Artscape, uh, our partner and, and good friends of ours, um, they're still present in this community and they still manage the Daniel Spectrum building on behalf of the RPAD board. Um, and they are committed to continuing to ensure that this space is a, an accessible space for the community. Um, and so if you have questions about this space or if you want to find a way to be involved in this space, then come visit the Artscape team. Find Fareed, who's here in the building, and they would be glad to help you uh, as CSI transitions out and Artscape it remains uh, uh, here and an active member of this community. CSI is inviting the Regent Park community to celebrate their time in Regent Park with a proper send-off at the What's Next Fest. Please join this celebration on February 23rd at the CSI Living Room at the Daniel Spectrum Building from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Community Resident Meeting Discussion on Rezoning on January 24th, 2023. Region Park resident Joan Warner organized and facilitated a community meeting for the residents of Region Park on January 24th, 2023. The meeting was attended by approximately 20 people and was held in the CSI living room space at the Daniel Spectrum building from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Attendees were invited to come and share their views and opinions on various issues affecting the community, including school bullying. One of the issues that was discussed in the meeting was on the Regent Park rezoning. This discussion was led by Stephanie Beatty, a member of the Regent Park Neighborhood Association. Let's hear what Stephanie Beatty has to say. Oh, so the rezoning, I don't know how many people have heard about it or, or know much about it. Maybe you've heard about it. There's been lots of consultations over the last uh, two years, I guess, led by Toronto Community Housing and the developer. There hasn't been very much led by the community, in, from my perspective. And what they plan to do is to turn the final phases of Regent Park into a high-density, high-rise development. Um, which, you know, this community was never meant to be, all the, the consultations and planning, and we've got a legal plan in place that says this is meant to be a mid-density community where, you know, they brought in more, more condos or, or more, uh, more density in order to be able to afford the revitalization of the community housing. Um, they kind of moved away from that a little bit in 2014. There was a rezoning where 2,000 more condos were added. So if you look this way and you see like much more high rises and maybe feel that there are a lot more condo owners in the community at that point during that rezoning, they made those changes. And now with Tridel on board, they want to make even more changes and add thousands of more units, which they're saying you know, that they're going to be adding uh, more community housing units. That remains to be seen. There's not really a financial commitment to that, so that could happen or it might not happen. It could all be condos in the end. Um, they could also start selling off the old Toronto community housing after 20 years, and it's going to be a lot longer um, that this community is going to be under construction as a result of the rezoning. Well, in Regent Park, they only have to keep the original uh, units for 20 years, I think, and then they can sell them if they want. So it'll, I just don't know, I mean, the, the proportions, I thought that original vision, which was like almost 50-50 or 40-60, was a really nice mix, mostly low and mid-rise buildings where you still have people who are connected to the street, where you still have a sense that you know, kind of know your neighbors. I think the more you move into a high-rise development, the more anonymity there is, the less connection to the community. You know, people who are living in, in the condos go up to their condos in the sky and, you know, they drive into their underground parking and they don't really feel connected to the, to the community. And what they're planning is that a lot of the remaining um, community housing is going to go into skyscrapers, which for me, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I look at all the problems that are happening in their Toronto community housing buildings, their inability to stay on top of maintenance, to keep things in good working order. You put that into a skyscraper or a high rise and suddenly the impact of that neglect is really significant on the people who live there. And also, you know, for seniors and others, you're just more isolated in a high rise than you are in, in a mid rise. Um, I think there are a lot of downsides and, and one of my big criticisms is that they haven't really engaged this community around what this rezoning means and the implications that it has for community and you know the, the councillors, both Kristen Wong Tam and now Chris Moyes, they've met first and repeatedly with the developer and with Toronto Community Housing and they're not meeting with the community. 
um, you know, there have been two meetings that have been led by Toronto Community Housing and, and the developer and the city, and it's all been controlled by them. People can ask a question, but nobody can ask a follow-up question. Um, and they're really kind of just giving out information that, from my perspective, suits them. And from my perspective, the big drive to increase, to do this rezoning is to make more money for the developer and for Toronto Community Housing. And personally, I think there are big negative impacts on the community. So that's, that's my perspective, but it was, what I was hoping, because I know people have different views on it, is that uh, maybe we could come together as a community to at least get our counselor to come and meet with us as a community and answer all of the questions that we have about the rezoning and to give us a really clear view of what it's going to mean for the community. And now, because they didn't get much pushback because they're controlling the consultation by hiding you know, most of this information and making it about everything else, and would you, what would you like to see? Would you like a library? Would you like this? Would you like that? And um, So now they've pushed it up even further to 40 stories, which is, which is a skyscraper. And they're going to have another almost 40 story building at the, the end. We're going to have a wall of tall towers along our park, which you know, I mean, the park right now is a really intimate space for people, families, especially with young kids. Like, everyone knows one another. But that will really fundamentally change the, um, the nature of the, the, the community. And because of all the delays, I mean, they really have no idea now when, you know, I guess they're saying June, but that doesn't mean that anything is going to happen to replace that building for years. <coughs> Moss Park residents mourn the loss of 61 trees cut down by Metrolinx. After Metrolinx cut down 61 mature trees on Sunday, January 5th, to make way for a new station for the Ontario Line area residents held a funeral. On Sunday afternoon, rumbling chainsaws supplied the soundtrack to the ceremony organized for the fallen trees by community members. Around two dozen attendees brought flowers, lit candles, and read an obituary through a megaphone, said Diane Deveni, a longtime Moss Park resident and co-organizer of the service. It was heartbreaking to listen to the cracking of the trees as they were broken apart and tossed to the ground, she said. The clearing of the 70-year-old trees came the same weekend as a judge granted an injunction blocking Metrolinx, the provincial transit agency in charge of building the Ontario line, from removing 11 centuries-old trees on the grounds of Osgood Hall until February 10th. It speaks volumes which trees get sacrificed first. It's trees that are located in less privileged, racialized communities, said Walid Kogali, co-founder of Moss Park Coalition. When I was at that funeral, I saw many tears and some of them from Indigenous youth who felt so powerless. Some Moss Park residents are advocating in a coalition called Build Ontario Line Differently, BOLD, to prevent more communities from meeting the same fate. Protesters rallied to increase access to shelter spaces. Dozens of Torontonians laid down on the frozen square on Monday, February 6, 2023, dramatizing sleeping on the street. The protesters rallying outside the doors of Toronto City Hall called on council to increase shelter spaces and other social supports. Ahead of series of council votes that would determine the fate of certain temporary shelters and warming centers, as well as operating spending. The Shelter Housing Justice Network, SHJN, is calling on City Council to keep warming centers open 24-7 for the rest of the winter, instead of operating them only when the temperature drops to minus 15 degrees Celsius. According to City data, 99% of warming center spaces were occupied during the extreme cold weather warning. The SHJN is also calling on Council to keep the doors open on five shelters that opened during the pandemic and are slated to close this year as the city transitions away from the temporary sites. It is also asking that the proposed nearly $50 million increase to the police budget be redirected to funding safe shelters instead of more officers on the street and in the transit system. It's 30 years since our country cancelled our national housing program and that's like the number one reason we're here today because of course we have a huge housing shortage 
But at the city level, we should be ashamed of ourselves. Um, when I began my work as a street nurse, there were about 3,000 people that were homeless in Toronto. And now over the course of a year, there's about 18,000. And on any given night, over 9,000. <laughs> and we don't have enough shelter beds. And I've been posting a lot on social media just reflecting on things we've talked about over the years, which is some of our shelters do not even meet the UN standard for refugee camps. So here today, people were here to speak and literally to beg for city council to pass a motion tomorrow that will say homelessness is a public health emergency, keep the warming centers open 24 seven and keep them open till end of winter. I would say longer because there's not going to be a sudden fix to this problem. And I think people would be surprised to know how really bare bones the warming centers are. We're not asking for the Ritz, you know. They're like a cot in a room. There's no locker to keep your belongings. There's not even a guarantee that there will be meals. Some places are delivering in meals to help out. Um, so the city is doing the bare minimum. And as a result, we see close to 200 deaths per year, uh, about four per week on average. And there's a memorial beside Holy Trinity that happens every month for people who've died. So this is a really rich country with a lot of poverty. And our mayor, uh, the mayor is really directly responsible for not ordering the city manager to do something. Um, I am here today in this rally along with community advocates and other experts to really bring attention to the uh, crisis that's happening to the unhoused people in the city, which is really the lack of adequate warming spaces, lack of adequate shelter spaces, um, which is causing, you know, a lot of harm to their health. Um, so we know that 160 people are being turned away every night at central intake, which is the central place where people go to find emergency shelter. So that means those 160 people are not being put in a shelter. They're having to sleep outside, you know, on subway lines, on the grates, in, a, in really um, inappropriate and unsafe places. Um, and that's causing uh, harm. So that's causing, you know, increased frostbites, hypothermia, and these people end up in the hospital with these injuries. Um, and really, you know, when people have frostbites, these injuries last, uh, stay with them for their lifetime, right? So pain and disability and the trauma of that. So what we're really asking for is for the city to do, to listen to the experts, to the evidence-based interventions, that is warming centers. So warming centers right now open at minus 15 degrees Celsius, uh, which is an inadequate, uh, which is inadequate, okay? So what we know is evidence shows that most of the injuries 72% in fact happen in the moderate cold. So that's below freezing, but above minus 15 degrees Celsius. Um, that means that we're pe leaving people out on the cold and at risk of these injuries. The risk of hypothermia almost doubles with every five degree decrease. So what we need is warming centers to be open through the entire winter and the Board of Health agrees, right? So they passed a motion saying that they, we need to have warming centers open through the winter until April 15th and currently the city has to pass to vote on this motion, and we hope that they uh, pass that motion. And you know, along with other interventions that are going to be long-term solutions, so things like, you know, respite spaces, keeping shelter spaces, shelter hotels open, uh, stopping encampment evictions. City of Toronto expands warming center space. On January 30th, a fourth warming center opened as a sealed community center. Located across the city, warming centers can accommodate more than 140 individuals who may be experiencing homelessness. The city was able to confirm the fourth warming center located at Cecile Community Center. Located next to the Kensington Market, Cecile Community Center is a nonprofit multi service neighborhood center offering services to local residents. The warming center will be equipped to welcome up to 30 people in need of a safe, warm place to rest. Two people stabbed in Sherburne Street and Dundas Street East area on January 29th. Toronto Police are investigating a homicide after a stabbing in Sherburne Street and Dundas Street East area on Sunday, January 29th. That left one man dead. In a new release, police identify Nelson Nyongabo, 26 of Toronto, as the victim. Police said he was found with several stab wounds near Sherburne Street and Dundas Street East on Sunday afternoon. 
The incident took place inside 251 Sherburn Street, just north of Dundas Street East, at around 3.40 p.m., police say. Nyon Gabo died of his injuries at the scene. The service also identified the suspect as Toronto resident Rasheen Ali, 31. Ali has been charged with second degree murder and is currently being held pending a bail hearing. City of Toronto proclaims February as Black History Month as city celebrates with in-person events across Toronto. City of Toronto proclaimed February as Black History Month in Toronto. The City of Toronto is proud to celebrate Black History Month through the production and support of numerous events and activities across the country to recognize the history, heritage, and contributions of Black Canadians. This year, the City is happy to once again safely offer in-person events following a two-year pivot to virtual events due to the COVID-19 pandemic. From musical performances and exhibits featuring Toronto artists to book readings and film screenings, the city is providing opportunities for all ages. Black History Month is an opportunity for the city to recognize the past and present positive contributions Black Canadians make to life in Toronto. In Toronto and beyond, Black Canadians have made important contributions to education, medicine, art, culture, public service, economic development, politics, and human rights. More information on the city's Black History Month events and activities can be found on the city's Black History webpage. COVID-19 and vaccination update. Toronto Public Health expands access to required children's vaccines through its immunization clinics. Toronto Public Health is expanding access to the nine children's vaccines required under Ontario's Immunization of School Pupils Act starting February 6, 2023. Parents and guardians of children from 4 to 17 years of age can book immunizations for diphtheria, tinnitus, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, meningococcal disease, pertussis, and varsiella at all six TPH immunization clinics. Students in grades 7 to 12 can also continue to access vaccines for human papillomavirus, meningococcal, and hepatitis B at these TPH immunization clinics. TPH is helping Toronto students catch up on life-saving vaccines that they may have missed during the COVID-19 pandemic. There is no fee for children to receive these vaccines and an OHIP card is not required. Appointments are preferred, though walk-ins will be accommodated based on capacity. Appointments can be made online through the TPH appointment booking system. The Burn, reflecting on the COVID-19 pandemic through art. The Burn is an interactive installation that provides a space for transformation, healing and letting go. From January 19 to March 11, the installation's vessel toured the city, inspiring Torontonians to set healing intentions on wooden spears. On March 11, the third anniversary of the official start of the pandemic, a commemorative ceremony featuring the burn takes place at Nathan Phillips Square in memory of lives lost. Experience a shared exhalation through fire, water, and immersive waves of sound as the vessel's wooden spears, along with fresh ones created on site, come together to ignite for a 24-hour burn from March 11 to 12. Vaccination update. Did you get a winter COVID-19 booster yet? The bivalent vaccine is now available for all residents five and over and recommended for everyone who hasn't received a booster in 2022. Book an appointment at toronto.ca slash COVID-19 or a mobile clinic near you. Bivalent boosters target the original COVID-19 virus and the Omicron variants. They provide better protection from becoming very sick with COVID-19 and provide strong protection against Omicron variants. You can get boosted at least six months after last COVID-19 dose or infection and at least three months if at high risk of severe illness from COVID-19. Vaccine and wellness clinics in the neighborhood. Wellness clinic at 200 Wellesley Street East, the corner, Tuesdays from 1.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Walk-ins are welcome. Cold, flu, COVID-19 testing and treatment clinic at 40 Oak Street, Regent Park, CHC. Every Wednesdays at 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. and Thursdays from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m. Wellness, Wellness Hub at 40 Oak Street, Regent Park, CHC. Saturdays from 9.30 a.m. to 12.30 a.m. Appointments recommended, walk-ins accepted. 
vaccine clinics at the 519. Get your COVID-19 and flu shots on Wednesdays from 3 to 6 p.m. For more information, contact community at the 519.org. Events and jobs in Regent Park. And now with the City of Toronto's events related to Black History Month celebration, all City Black History Month exhibits and events are free for the public to experience. Black Women in Leadership Photo Exhibit. The Toronto Archives, in partnership with Black Artists, Networks and Dialogue Gallery and Cultural Centre, present the Black Women in Leadership Photography Exhibition, featuring portraits of 40 Black women leaders by four Toronto-based virtual artists. On display until August 2023, the exhibit celebrates and highlights Black leaders across various sectors who have led and continue to inspire change in their communities while paving the way for the next generation of leaders through our community involvement and advocacy. The Black Women in Leadership exhibit at the Toronto Archives will be on display until August. Photos by Janice Reed, Leila Jetty, John Black, and Patricia Ayla. Entrepreneur Market. A Black Entrepreneur's Market will take place at the Centennial Park Ski Chalet on the evening of Friday, February 24th, and during the day on Saturday, February 25th. Honoring Black Freedom at Select Toronto History Museums. The city's museums will deliver a free event series in February that will honor Black freedom throughout music, culture, and storytelling that will uplift and warm the souls of those who experience it. Programming will be hosted at the Spadina Museum, 285 Spadina Road, Mackenzie House, 82 Bond Street. And now, Kita, we continue with events and jobs in the community. Center for Social Innovation. What's Next Fest? Local vendors, Family Portraits, Zero Proof Bar, Dream Center, Eats Community Visions Mural, Dance Floor, CSI. Couldn't leave without a party. CSI Community Living Room, February 23rd, 2023. 3 o'clock to 10 o'clock p.m. Come join us at the Daniel Spectrum, 558 Dundas Street East. Come dance with us Wednesdays from 3 to 4 p.m. As a part of our weekly exercise class, Dancing with Parkinson's will be sharing the joy and benefits of dance and movement. All abilities are welcome. Skating party. Sunday, February 19th, 2023, from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. It's a free event at Regent Park Ice Rink at 480 Shooter Street. Black Movie Magic. Celebrating the stories that shine a spotlight on black voices. Come join us on February 24th at the Daniel Spectrum at 585 Dundas Street East for Black Movie Magic Night. Free entry. Free mental health first aid training. Let's talk illness of the mind. Exclusive opportunity for youth ages 15 to 25 to learn more about mental health. Healthy coping habits and resources available for mental health crises. What do I learn? Common signs and symptoms of mental health challenges. Content on stigma, beliefs, and attitudes towards mental health. How to interact with a person in a mental health crisis. Resources available for mental health in your public speaking and improved communication skills. Get employment ready and network with industry professionals. Moving towards opportunity. 14-week job readiness program for high school students from March 17, 2023 to June 20th, 2023. Eight-week summer internship opportunity from July 4th, 2023 to August 25th, 2023. Open to grade 11 and 12 students. Priorities given to grade 12. Priority given to youth living in TCH from Regent Park, St. Jamestown, Rivertown and surrounding areas. Applications due February 24th, 2023. Need money for post-secondary school? 
apply for the investing in our diversity scholarship eligible applicants can receive up to four thousand to cover tuition fees and school related expenses for full-time post-secondary education or training that was all for today's show my name is javen and my co-hosts are victoria fred peter and matthew we also like to thank our team of researchers that contributed for this week's show and from our studios at Focus Media Art Center. Thanks for watching and see you next week. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And please follow our social media platforms. For more information, check out our website.